In the last 12 months, I gave Lennox 42 million. The people around him told him, is that all you've got? Is that all 42 million? He's cheated you. I turned around as a guy with a mask on, and I can remember him shaking like a leaf with a gun. I have no regrets. No one is perfect, you know what I mean? I'm not a perfect man. I'm, I'm just like any other human being. Watch me! Watch me! Promoters are guys who take risks. You arrange fights that the public wants to see. The bigger the promoter, as I say, the bigger the risk. A promoter is a guy like Frank Warren. Make the people think that this is the greatest event that anybody ever want to see. They had to be able to convince people a bad fighter is a good fighter. It's all about showing confidence and giving the right image. The public perception of a boxing promoter is a crook. Mm. I think someone who takes advantage of young boys in this seedy world of, of late night boxing. Where are we get to the ring? This one? Oh, no, this is <laughs> Frank Warren is Britain's top boxing promoter in a big money business. Quite simply, promoters hire a venue, sell the tickets, pay the fighters, and if there's anything left, they make a profit. It's a game where everyone's out to make as much money as possible. Warren's at Wembley, but everyone knows where the world's fight capital is. But even in Vegas, nothing can happen until the world's most famous promoter arrives, Don King. Hey, Don, how are you? Okay, can't wait to see you. We'll be waiting for you. Bye-bye. He's running late, is he, Don? He is very in demand. Don is an in-demand person. Hi there. It's never difficult working for Don because he's such a good-natured guy. Yeah, here I am, right here. Tell Don to stop right here. How are you? Good, good, good. There's nothing like being in a room when Don King walks in. Everybody that's ever been in a room where Don King walked in remembers that. Because, you know, there he is. <laughs> the man, the myth, the legend. This final press conference now, how important is it for you in the, the promotion of the fight? Well, it's very important because it's the finale. Lower level, please. Lower level? Sure. Thanks. Don King is in town to promote a world heavyweight title fight. King is 69 years old now and as enthusiastic as ever. The number one promoter, though, as we'll discover, also has another side to his character. You're about to go out and perform again. Are you, are you excited by it, Don? Yes, I'm in very excited. Hey, Don, how you doing, man? I don't think people understand, and I don't think they will until he passes, that he will be remembered as the greatest promoter ever. P.T. Barnum moves to seat number two in heaven. What makes you the greatest promoter? I'm a promoter of the people, for the people, and by the people. My magic lies about people ties. I love the people, all races, colors, creeds, and religions. And I try to promote excitement to them as a John the Baptist, so to speak, a voice crying in the wilderness. Some of boxing's biggest names in one spectacular night of fights. So what I do is try to give them the biggest and the best events in history. John Ruiz, he's got a score to settle with four-time heavyweight champion Evander Holyfield. Allow me to bring up to this podium the real deal, Evander Holyfield. Right on. Call now. Call your cable operator on your satellite. Call now. Four-time heavyweight champion Evander Holyfield is the star attraction on this King show. And when it comes to big-time promotion, Holyfield says no one does it better than Don King. He's a good promoter. I would say he's the best of the best. I was reading that you'd earned over a hundred million dollars plus. I mean, are those sort of figures correct? Well, well you know, I've made more than I am. I've made in the 200 million in the game of boxing. I've been blessed. So this fight for you on Saturday, is it a good pay night for you? I don't take it for granted. You, you, you know, you say, well, it's a 12 round fight. You tell me 36 minutes of working. And you say, you know, how many people in 36 minutes make more than $5 million? What's the going rate now to get Naz in the ring? You're being a nosy bastard again. Can't tell you. 
for me to reveal on television what I think I've made, in, in my heart, will be not right. Over a 15-year period, I've made a few, I've made a few million pounds, I suppose. Yeah, I How mean, much would he earn for his next fight? I'm not going to tell you that, you nosy bastard. I've told you. You've asked me that question before, I'm not fucking telling you. I haven't made as much money as Frank Bruno made. Gary, if you ask me the truth, mustn't complain, son. Mustn't complain at all. I've got all of these cars, <laughs> I've got all of these houses, <laughs> and I've got such and such no, 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 a yeah, respect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's no, silly. No, 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 you know? no, 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 no. In the red corner, an unofficial heavyweight champion of Great Britain, Lenny Bryan. Frank Warren began promoting in 1978. Then he promoted outside the jurisdiction of the official board, but that soon changed. But I got fed up with that after a while because it, it, it was tough. It was hard work promoting and being involved in that. And I got an approach from the Boxing Board of Control asking me if I'd take a promoter's license out. So I think they thought I was better inside the tent than outside the tent. So uh, that's what happened. I got involved and, uh, and carried on from there. He was up against the powerhouses of the day, which was a group of men. It was Harry Levine, Mickey Duff, Mike Barrett and Terry Lawless. Do you think it was good that Warren came along and that there was another major promoter suddenly in the game? No, I think... But I think boxing was far healthier then than it is now. I don't blame specifically Frank Warren for it. Some days when, you know, the office is quiet, we think of things to wind them up. So we'd, you know, we'd, I mean, we'd do all you know, silly stunts and so forth. And it really did get to them at the time. But it was a laugh. And it's just, uh, you know, because you're young, you're a bit sort of jack the lad and you're cheeky and whatever. So, you, you know, but they were fun days. What did you think of him when he came in? Did you like him? No, I don't like him now. I can remember one day ringing Mickey Duff till it, my printer had let me down. And could he, could he have a word with his printer regarding prints and posters and, uh, and tickets? He said to me, if you were the last person alive, I wouldn't have. I mean, he just bit it and, and he was all giggling at me. It's just silly stuff, you know, kid stuff. Eventually, he took over and they went off the scene and he became Britain's number one promoter. He's held that position for many years and looking around, there's no one to challenge him. You know, when you've got one organisation controlling boxing, I don't particularly think it's good for, for the sport as a whole. When you've got competition, you know, two or three different guys who can come with, you know, TV, decent money, promotions, I think it's a, a lot healthier situation. I've opened it up. I mean, it's not just Frank Warren. There's, I mean, there's a lot of people involved there in boxing. You've got, you've got Panasiliadis out there. You've got um, uh, Audley Harrison, you know, doing his own thing now. You've got um, uh, uh, Barry Hearn. Quite a few people are now, and even the Hammers are all doing their own thing. So it's opened up, it's made it, it's made it more competitive, it's great for the boxers, more better for the boxer now, and it keeps everybody on their toes. Don King hit the big time promoting Muhammad Ali in 1974, but he's no stranger to controversy. He's been accused of shortchanging some of his fighters. But even though his reputation is tainted, he still craves the limelight. Even after all this time, there's never a morning when you think, oh, it'd be easier to lay in bed today. Nah, those thoughts may come, but those are for guys who wake up and they don't want to do nothing. The energy here is so exciting, so provocative, so beautiful, you know what I mean, that I just want to just continue to climb the stairway to heaven. Don King is notorious for having cut fighters' purses. And that happened to Tim Witherspoon when Don King brought him to London to fight Frank Bruno for the heavyweight championship of the world. In terms of a fee, how much were you expecting? I was expecting, um, I was expecting, um, uh, over a million dollars. Tim figured that Don King was going to steal from him. He figured that Don King would take money. Did Don King take advantage of you? At the time, at the time I would say yeah. He just figured that there's so much money in this fight that he would still go home with a substantial amount of money, maybe eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars 900000 How much did he end up with? He ended up walking home with $90,000. He's going to go down, he's going to go down. Wiggles has got him in the 11th round, and Bruno goes over and Wiggles hit him while he's on the floor, and the towel has come in from Terry Morris. It's all over. And when in the ring with Tim Witherspoon, there's only supposed to be me and him fighting, but there's about 30 people around in the ring with him. Then 30 people ain't from England, then 30 people are from America, and they all have to be paid for. You have a situation where Tim was forced to train at Don King's camp in Orwell, Ohio, and uh, it has here 28 days at $100 a day, 
and actually they total that out to $28,000. So what should have been $2,800 ends up being $28,000. Everything was taken and cut from his purse so that he got barely $100,000 out of the promised million and had to resort to suing Don King. During this time, Tim received some threats, didn't he? Tell me about that. Well, I mean, he received threats that were obviously connected to the lawsuit. Whether they were directly connected to Don King or not, nobody will ever know. You, you were sufficiently frightened, if that's the right word, though, to go out and buy a gun? Yeah. Yeah. Tim Witherspoon sued Don King for his money. He eventually got a settlement. That is an admission then by Don King that he did cheat Tim Witherspoon out of some of his money, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I estimated that he took a lot of, he took millions of dollars from me that I could have made that I didn't make. Shortchanged by King, Larry Holmes decided to join King's main rival. You go to Bob and he says, I'll break your legs. Don King personally threatened to break your oh, legs. Oh, yeah, he said that. And I told him I'd kill him. I said, if you come towards me with any threats, I said, I would kill you. I said, I would shoot you. If you were to total up how much he shortchanged you, what would it add up to? About 20, 30 million, maybe. Yeah. In a way, it's hard to blame Don King completely when he is just exploiting a system which is badly broken. But it's not only boxers who King has fallen out with. He was also involved in a bitter split with Frank Warren. Why did they part? Basically, it was because I, I didn't like what he did with the contracts. He signed, a, he, he put a, uh, a clause on a contract that was never there in the first place. And uh, it was added on after the event, and I didn't, I didn't want to be working after that. They can say what they will of me, with my word in my bond. You lost a court case to Don King. How much money did that cost you? I didn't lose the court case. We settled. It was a settlement. It okay, cost so me, tw it cost me uh, it wound up costing me $12 million. A lot of people would see that losing $12 million is defeat, Frank. I thought it was cheap to get away. I look at it the other way around. I bought back my... my um, I'll tell you exactly what happened. I brought back my freedom. Had a lot of fun, my friend. Had a lot of fun. We had the best dinners. Go to the rest places, you know what I mean? It was really nice, you know what I mean? So... Uh, and um, sadly enough, I do miss old Frank. You know, he's a good guy. To, to, to most people listening to those sort of figures, they would want to sort of melt into the ground. Now, I know you're used to dealing with big figures, but even for you, when, when you have to settle for, for $12 million, it, I, it's a bitter pill to swallow, I, I would think, have thought. I think what, it was a bitter pill, but what goes around comes around. It's a fact of life. I mean, things always level out. So Boxing is driven by money, and everyone wants their fair share, and a little bit more if possible. The boxers are the ones who are taking the punches, you know? Why is it then that is it the promoters who has the most money? Us fighters just want a fair crack at the whip. They, they want a bigger slice but, of the cake, but, and you can understand that, Of course I guess. you can understand it, but it's like everything, you can understand it. But you say you're giving, you're not giving, we don't... You know, we don't show up and just pull our hands out, we work. We work, we have to work, you know, it's, and, and they're, of course they're entitled to the biggest slice. And I'm not turning around and saying that every promoter takes more money than the fighter. I'm not saying that. I'm saying blatantly, we want more money for fighting our right in that ring than a guy sitting down ringside with a dicky bow on. What's the biggest gamble you've ever made financially? Could you give us an idea? I've put my house up. you put your go. house up as collateral? I've done that. put my house up in the early days. put my house up. What, what does your wife say when you say, if we lose this deal, we lose the house? She knew at the end of the day, to have faith in me, it'll all work out. And, and did it work out? Well, yeah, we, we would have bought a bigger house after it. <laughs> <laughs> And back at Wembley, Frank Warren's show is heading towards the main attraction, a world title fight. As the promoter, are you actually nervous sitting ringside because you're responsible for all of this at Wembley, aren't you? I'm not nervous. No, I enjoy it. I mean, as I say, I'm, the hard work's been done. This is, for me, the hard work's been done. The hard work is now for the boxers. 
And when you're sitting watching the fighters as well, are you sort of thinking, this guy's doing well, four or five fights down the road, he could yeah. go for a world title, you're that's that's the next big deal you're working you on? You're mentally, you know, you're sitting mentally making matches, thinking, you know, a couple more fights, we're moving here, moving there, and that's, that's, that's really what we do. And Panos Eliades seemed to hold all the aces as promoter to the world heavyweight champion, despite starting late in the game. I started off in boxing as a hobby. Um, I never... I never took it serious, and although they said to me that this new boxer called Lennox Lewis would be world heavyweight champion, I never believed it. Uh, the total amount I invested in Lennox is about $5 million, so it took about nine years to break even and get my money back, which is not a good investment, because if I put the money in the bank, it would have been a safe investment, and I think I would have had twice as much as what I've got today. But now the investment's gone sour. The promoter and fighter have split in another row over money. I never say he never made any money off me. With the amount of fights that I've had, with the amount of money that I've made in each fight, I can never say that. You, you know, you, you must think people are idiots out there, but they're not. He's sacked you, hasn't he? What do you feel he, about that? He can't sack me. But effectively, he's told you he doesn't want you to be his promoter. That's as good as sacking you. But I don't really want to be his promoter. I don't want to be associated with the person that Lennox Lewis is today. He's not a nice man. So do I need to be associated with that man? No, not really. I felt that this was the, t the right time for me to step out by myself. I've been with Panos a long time, and I don't need to be with him anymore. In the last 12 months, I gave Lennox 42 million. The people around him told him, is that all you got? Is that all 42 million? He's cheated you. You should have got 142 million. And if you got 142 million, he was cheated because he should have got 342 million. So you can never satisfy these people. I said that he's just trying to put bad karma on me. I've got too much good karma to let that affect me. How much do you think Lennox Lewis is actually worth? I know exactly how much Lennox Lewis is worth, but I can't, I won't disclose that. No matter what my relationship is with Lennox, it's not fair to disclose that. But I can tell you something, it is easily lost. And it can be lost just as easily even more easily than the last 10 years he created it. Would it be right to say in excess of 100 million pounds? He's worth today, no. No, he's not worth in excess of 100 million pounds. I think he's earned, in the total of, uh, over the last 10 years, must be going on to about 60, 70 million. <laughs> Lennox Lewis's next payday was in South Africa against Hassim Rachman, where things went horribly wrong. Oh, he's got him! He's got him! He got Kenneth and he's got him! Is it Oliver McCall all over again? It is! And Lewis has gone! Lewis has gone! And that picture will be in the papers of Ron the World. There's great animosity between you and Lennox. There must have been a, a small part of you that when Rackman landed with a punch, you thought, great. There wasn't. There should have been, but I don't understand. I actually felt sad, because don't forget you've got 11 years of history together, and you never want to see the man who you've looked after as your son go down. So all the bad things that have happened in the past nine months really went out the window. Days after the fight, Don King nipped in to sign Hassim Rachman. He also promotes the WBA champion, John Ruiz. So now, once again, King controls the heavyweight division. Lennox Lewis, though, still maintains that boxers should manage and promote themselves. I tell other boxers out there, make your own decisions, uh, choose your own destiny, and, and learn to survive by yourself. You don't need a lot of different people's managers, promoters out there. You know, that you can step out by yourself. To be you, it had to be you. Audley Harrison is hot property after winning a gold medal at the Sydney Olympics. All the promoters were keen to sign him, but he wasn't interested. I've gone my own way, and people are a bit sour about that. I've gone my own way, uh, you know, but it's business. This is boxing, it's not personal. I think Audley is, you know, taken you know, his control to another level. You know, he's a progressive fighter, and he's in a situation whereby he's got a deal with BBC. So, I mean, the promoters need him 
more than he needs a promoters. I want to be the boss and, and I want to be the captain of the ship. So when the ship sinks, if it sinks, uh, then I'm the one who sunk it, not somebody else. And then I'm blaming that girl, that person for my own troubles. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if he can, you know, go on in the future to earn, you know, huge amounts of money. You know, he's got everything in place at the moment. He's got a very strong, solid, uh, solid team. And providing he goes out there and, um, you know, keeps them winning, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that he can go on to become a world heavyweight champion and, um, you know, a multi-millionaire. Audley Harrison is now a brand, he's now a product. And everything that's generated as a result of that is going to be, I'm going to be the one benefiting, not somebody else. <laughs> But in Audley Harrison's first pro fight six days ago, Harrison was involved in a bitter dispute with opponent Mike Middleton over Middleton's fee for fighting. Show us the fucking letter you've got. You've got a letter telling us how to sign. That was got to um, my own issue we're trying to move over at the moment. But... See you fun and game. <laughs> Pre-fight entertainment was drawing to a close. Incredibly, the row rumbled on. In the corridor outside the boxer's dressing room, the arguments involved lawyers and agents. Middleton wouldn't fight until a deal was struck. Just to pre-warn you, it hasn't happened yet. There may be a slight delay. Eventually, agreement was reached. Middleton didn't last long. Middleton had signed a contract to fight Harrison for £3,500. That contract also said Middleton should receive 21% of the television fee, which would have given him a considerable bonus. Days before the fight, Harrison's manager, Colin McMillan, asked Middleton to sign a new contract, which didn't include the television bonus. He says the television percentage should have been taken out of Middleton's original contract. Um, Mike Middleton signed a contract. Obviously, mistakes were made, and he tried to exploit the situation. But you know, there were certain people, you know, around him who tried to undermine myself, the whole promotion, and the BBC. You say that he tried to exploit the situation. Some would say that you asked him to sign a new contract, you were actually trying to cheat him out of a large amount of money. What do you say to that? Mm. That's not true at all. I think he's quite clear. He signed a, an ade a deal. There were two American matchmaking people confirming that. He spoke to myself, he spoke to the promoter. He knew exactly what he was entitled to. Um, a mistake was made. And um, obviously, you know, he was compensated, you know, generously from that. There's talk that he'll go home with £20,000 plus, when it was only going to be about 3000 Well. The bottom line is, he, whatever he was contractually uh, signed to, to receive, he's received it. Uh, and I haven't, I haven't got a problem with that. Team A4 hasn't got a problem with that. You know, think this has been a very successful show. But, but uh, is he going to get a lot more? Can you just tell us that? Is it £20,000? Well, because that, that, that's the word that I, I, like I, I said, I'm I'm, I'm not at liberty to say that at the moment. I'm not, I'm not sure what's been, what's been agreed, finally. Uh, but he, he has been compensated. But it, he's been compensated like he should have been compensated. Don King has a past that not everyone's aware of, and he's one of America's most famous faces. Don, you've been described as the world's greatest promoter. Do you think you are? I, mean, it, I think it more matters about what you think, you know what I mean, and go to the scoreboard. If you can find any type of uh, bumps and ridges in that, you know, then the image, then you know you have to see them because you're only informing your, your constituency, you know what I mean? But I think that. Uh, the record speaks for itself, and that's what I really rely upon, because I love the people. Don King is probably one of the most despicable people on the face of the earth. Savage-like, animal-like. A con man that makes uh, Sven Galli look like an amateur. He's really, really barbaric. Don King is the devil, man. The hair sticks up is to hide them horns. That's why the hair sticks up. <laughs> Reports are coming in that a man has been rushed to hospital and is fighting for his life after being attacked outside a Cleveland bar. Police who witnessed the attack arrested Donald King at the scene. King was armed and taken into custody. He's out on patrol April 20th, 66, on Cedar Avenue. We saw a group of people up ahead in a main attraction. I saw men, a man laying on the ground, his head bouncing off the ground, and a man kicking him. We immediately... Sp 
sped up to the area, pulled into the curb, and he jumped out of the car. I said, drop the gun. He took the gun and threw it over this way. I turned to grab the gun. He goes over and kicks that guy right in the head. I mean a kick. In front of you? Right in front of me. That's when I grabbed his hands, put them behind his back. But even as he was handcuffed, he got him one last final fatal kick to the head. And the, the, the victim, were you able to do anything for him? Well, the victim, him? he's laying down there. I could see the blood come out of his mouth, his ears. I bent over, kneeled over to see if he'd say anything. And the only thing he said, I'll pay you, Donald, I'll pay you, Donald. And that was the last word he said. He just passed out. News headlines, and five days after being attacked outside a bar, a man named as Sam Garrett has died in hospital. Garrett was attacked by Donald King, who is now being charged with Garrett's murder. It is believed that King made the attack over an unpaid gambling debt. In the lead-up to Don King's trial for murder, what was that like? Well, I was approached two different occasions, somebody, somebody trying to bribe me with the offer of money, or Don King can help me. And one of the main witnesses who made a statement at this time of what she described, they never found that witness. They searched for her, looked for her, and they never found her. He was summarily arrested, arraigned, convicted, and sentenced to jail for manslaughter, reduced from murder one, and served four years in jail. And it's a well-documented incident. It was his second killing. The first was in self-defense, or at least it was so pleaded. What do you feel about him now, all these years on? Uh, I never could understand it. The man had committed a murder. He even got invited to the White House for dinner at one point. But when he got out of prison, he just became a millionaire. I, I can't explain it. And knowing what he is, what he was, a murderer, numbers man, racketeer, you wonder how to get away with these things, but he has. Do you think back to that time, though, when you were in, in prison and reflect and look back with sadness now? No, I look back with joy. Look how far I've come. Do you feel, though, that sometimes people are, are after Don King? They're out to get you. I'm constantly being harassed and chased, but it's for a reason, you know mm. what I mean? Who, who harasses you? Well, anybody. The people that would come and say what they want to do, you know, I might have been indicted four or five times. I don't know what for. Do you have any regrets at all when you look back at your life? I have no regrets. I only look forward to doing better and try to expiate for whatever I sins that I may have committed. Do you think by you have trying to do good for others. Uh, do you think you have committed sins then? Well, certainly. No one is perfect, you know what I mean? I'm not a perfect man. I'm, I'm just like any other human being. What would your biggest sin be then, Don, when you, say, you use that word? Well, you don't know what my biggest sin would be because only God can judge by what your sin is and what the circumstances that evolved and made it happen. You must let him be the judge and the jury and the prosecutor. You know what I mean? You know, I can't, I can't do that because I got to take the two by four out of my eye before I can take this splinter out of yours. You know what I mean? Judge not yet, you be judged. When you, when you do interviews, though, do you I'm ever... I'm going to be your program. You're going to be our program. <laughs> can I just ask you? When you do... When you, when you, I you, love England, too, baby. <laughs> the BBC, the only place to be when you be watching TV. London's Elephant and Castle, a Sunday afternoon. Yes. Why did we not keep the heavyweight fight till the very last? Because I knew it was going to be like that. Because everyone's time. asleep out there, yeah. eh? So we're lining up now. Which one are lining up? You think I'm joking? Even the strippers wouldn't even wake him up, eh? Around the body, Jason. Around the body. Frank Maloney, manager of Lennox Lewis, is always on the lookout for the next champion. Come on, Jason, let him go. Come on, Jason! I mean, I've always described it as the theatre with blood. Moving, Jason, moving. Just putting the whole thing together and then turning up on the night, seeing the crowd and obviously getting the results of your way. Please with that? Please with fitness. Hey? Please with fitness. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, that's what's fire. He's awful because he's a southpaw. But Maloney is also involved in another boxing battle. He recently teamed up with Frank Warren, splitting from long-time promotional partner Panos Eliadis. I mean, you know, there's going to be a bitter war there between the, the new Lewis team and, and, and the old team. I'm pretty boring at the Arsenal, as I'm not involved in it. Frank Maloney left you after the best part of ten years to join a rival promoter, Frank Warren. What did you think about that when Fra that happened? Frank Maloney was sacked. I sacked Frank Maloney for changing contracts and for trying to entice boxers away. He said to us in an interview this week that um, he sacked you because you changed contracts and you did things behind his back. What do you say to that? Show me the proof that I've done that. Why would I change any contracts? 
What I did do is I added my name to a contract to protect a fighter on the say-so of the fighter's manager. That's what I did do. He begged me not to publicise it. He said, please don't tell anybody. Give me a week. I need to sort myself out. Again, taking my, my kindness as a weakness, I allowed him the week. Panos Eliades knows I was going to leave him. Um, I informed him I was going to leave him. And he's, he's just had to come back saying he's very bitter and very twisted. He also said you earned a million dollars as well in one year from him. That's well, the name of the game. Don't do it for love, do you? You certainly I do it for love. I'd want million. her to work with Panos Eliades. I think that was cheap. I'd have wanted 12 million to work with him. I'd have paid a Don King with it. Yeah. Oh, uh, in the boxing world, the promoter's best friend is often his lawyer. Bernard, Frank uh, said you, you want to have a chat about the, uh, the situation. Yeah, well, he, he's slagging off everybody at the moment. Yeah. It, you know, is he worth the powder and shot, do you think? Or is, it, is, it, is it commercially sensible to, well, for, to go for it? What I would do, I, I, would, I would go for it. By doing something, you are, you know, he's going to be in a position where he's going to have to shut his mouth, or otherwise he's going to get trouble. Sure. Because he's yeah. not going to be able to stand up any of the rubbish that he's, he's, he's saying. There's likely to be quite a long-running punch-up over this. Uh, he's uh, not likely to buckle. No, I'm sh quite sure he will do, but I don't think he's going to... He won't be able to come up with a valid justification, no. that's for sure. No, no. Good. All right, and, and Frank, I'll see you in court on Monday morning. OK, yes, yeah, see you at court Monday. Right, and Julius is going to be there as well, and I've given him all the details. OK, then. All right, cheers Bye. out. Bye. 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 Another one. Soldier. <laughs> you secretly all enjoy the sort of aggravation. Would that be right? Yeah, it's part of the business, isn't it? It's part, you know, it's a, it's a, um, a battle of the fittest. Only the fittest will survive in this business. You know, I, I've been in it since 1979. Um, I'm still here. I've seen people come and go. I've seen people I thought were good promoters come and go. Um, it's just a matter of pure determination, willpower, and belief in yourself. At <laughs> Wembley Arena, the night's main attraction is about to start. Ricky Hatton, one of boxing's rising stars, is about to enter the ring for a shot at the world title. The, the main event is now sort of uh, minutes away. Then, then do you sort of start to get nervy inside? No, not nervy. Um... I know that Ricky's got a good trainer, I know he's a very dedicated professional, I know he's got a good head on his shoulders, and he knows what he's got in front of him, and I'm, I'm fairly, fairly confident he should do well, and, uh, and I'll be surprised if he doesn't come out as champion tonight, but in boxing you never know what can happen, you never know, but uh, you know, it's no point being nervous about it. And Hatton could go on to earn big money, and where there's big money there's sometimes corruption. Robert Lee, the former IBF president, has been found guilty of money laundering. Some promoters paid Lee large sums of money in under-the-counter payments. One of the big scandals we've had recently, and you have to understand, I was always asked, isn't this another black eye for boxing? And boxing ran out of black eyes about 1910. But the one of recent vintage is the paying of money by promoters to have their fighters rated higher in the rankings by a sanctioning body like an IBF. Well, the IBF was found guilty not of accepting money but money laundering because they had accepted money from promoters like Cedric Kushner. I wanted to get South African fighters included in the ratings so that they could fight for the world championship. And the only way that that would happen, unfortunately, was by paying money. It's disgraceful. Uh, I'm sorry that he had to do it. I happen to admire Mr. Kushner for his honesty. And what was the largest sum of money you had to pay him? Oh, you're being nasty now. Mm, but, but how much was it? $100,000. $100,000 to get one of your boxers ranked? To accomplish something. And, and did you have to pay him cash? They don't normally take credit cards in that type of business. So what did you do? Go along with a suitcase full of money? And, and literally hand it, hand it over to him? To his uh, delegate, to his messenger. And, and, and where was this done? Was this hand, handed over in a, a, a remote rendezvous? How did it work? Uh, I think we should move on. We all know that follow boxing, that uh, who, the, who the contenders are and who isn't, and yet these alphabet soup organizations manipulate the sport 
usually at the detriment uh, of the fighter. Despite a recent defeat, Nassim Hamad is one of the sport's biggest stars. He's managed by his brother, but that hasn't stopped some people trying to take advantage. Some people have tried um, to kind of like uh, pay, not so much pay off, but bribe, I would say. For you to do things against your brother? Yeah. That's extraordinary. Mm, yeah. Just certain negotiational points that they want me to kind of forget or just to waver or smooth over, those kind of points. And they say that if you do that, while Nassim Hamid would earn a lot of money, you could actually earn a lot of money in your back pocket. Absolutely. And there's always Hollywood's view of boxing. Hurry up and tell him, Tony. You ain't got much time, so listen. You gotta lay down, Stoker. Lay down? Look, it's supposed to be in the bag. There's 20 bucks extra in it for you, maybe 30. You, you've never ever seen a crooked fight or ever heard of one? I've seen some bad mismatches, but I've never seen a crooked fight ever. I've never heard of anybody being paid money to take a dive. Never. And I'll say it, never in my time, boxing. I don't like anybody to Welsh. Boxers invariably 99.9% .9 of boxers hate to lose they wouldn't just accept it like that and you couldn't walk into a dressing room and tell a boxer that but I paid for something tonight and I didn't get it I don't like that stoker but not even Hollywood could have scripted what happened in 1989 one of the most sensational stories ever in boxing was the evening Frank Warren was shot. The night that it happened, what do you remember about it? Um, the pain. The pain, really. You know, the sh it, I don't know if he's shocked like, you know, frightened. I thought it was a joke to start with. I heard this bang and I thought it was a, it was a car backfiring. Detectives believe the gunman who shot the boxing promoter Frank Warren in London last night was a professional killer. Mr. Warren was hit several times as he arrived at a boxing match he'd arranged. Then I turned around as a guy with a mask on, shaking. You know, I can remember him shaking like a leaf with a gun. And it happened, it seemed to happen slow, but it was obviously happened very fast. And uh, I, thought, I honestly thought it was a joke, I thought it was a starting pistol. It revived memories of the old gang violence of the East End. A gunman waiting in the darkness as Frank Warren got out of his chauffeur-driven Bentley. Shortly after that, Terry Marsh was charged with his attempted murder. The whole thing was uh, a very tenuous uh, uh, link with me. It turned out that uh, the only evidence was against me was uh, an inmate uh, who made a, I use the phrase, a cell confession. Into the chest here, came out under my arm, into my arm, and then out my arm. So it's uh, a bit like a pinball machine. Do you have your suspicions? I know, do it. But for legal reasons, you can't tell us. Not a question of legal reasons. We know it's probably one of those terrible things where I was brought up, is you didn't, you don't, uh, for want of a better word, you don't be, be a grass. So I would never say it was. At the time, I didn't know it was. So I didn't lie, I didn't commit perjury in court, because at that time, I didn't know, but I know now it was. But, you know, as I say, where I come from, you know, that's how it is. I think the police are unwittingly manipulated. By who? Uh, <laughs> uh, as much as the BBC have uh, got a big sports budget, I don't think they'll be able to actually uh, afford to pay the libel, <laughs> the libel fees for it. <laughs> it was a desperate idiot, lunatic, coward, and uh, couldn't even do it properly. Do you think it was boxing related? Uh, I, I honestly don't, I don't know. But you would yeah. have some sort of opinion? Oh, yeah, I've got, an, I've got an opinion. It wasn't actually boxing related. It wasn't boxing related. Um, what happened was, uh, it was nothing to do with what happened in the ring. At the time, after the trial, you were quoted as saying, um, contrary to popular belief, um, I didn't shoot Frank Warren. Yeah. Which will forevermore leave the question as to who did. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it gets back to what, what I've said before, but with the, uh, the police being unwittingly manipulated. So, uh, I, you know, I, I can't really say much more than that. I know it is. That's all that matters to me. You know, uh, I know it is, and uh, that's all that counts. At 
at Wembley, another show over for Frank Warren. And it's been a good night. His fight has won. Can you imagine what a star this kid would be? They get all the nerves. That's what I'm saying. What's the matter with Not picking up. Yeah. Yeah. Mugs, this is what they want. Yeah, he throws a lot of punches, doesn't he? He's the most exciting fight in the country. Don't he's got great composure, you know. Yeah. He, 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 he focuses. He do not panic about it, you know. <laughs> good, good body oh, shots. Broke the kid's rib. Yeah. Everyone's saying who's that. Well done, well done. You've, done you've, done, you've done the business in Star again. Tremendous, tremendous performance. You, you live and breathe boxing. Can you ever see yourself giving up? Well, I say time and time again, you know, that maybe another year, another two years, and I will. Um, but this is bring, you, know, you just get back involved and you're in there again in great moments. And you fall out. Sometimes with fighters from a business point of view like Naz, I was there and I made Naz's fight when he won the world title. I'm really proud of great moments. I won't forget those, I'm sure he won't. You all secretly like the aggravation, I think, of it, don't you? Well, if it's easy, everybody will be doing it. Right on, people! I think Mickey Duff had a great phrase once, if you want loyalty, buy a dog. You do the fighting, boy, and we do the thinking. Because you ain't got a brain, that's why you're a fighter. But in this business, you've got to kill. When you're a gladiator and you've got the man on the floor, and they plead for mercy, you've got to cut the throats. How much do you, money do you think you went through? Okay, I don't know. <laughs> Millions? Not over three. Don King pointed at me and he said, there's my good friend, Senator McCain, my good friend, Senator McCain. Together, we're going to clean up the sport of boxing. <laughs> it was beautiful. You know what I mean? We shall never surrender.